God willing, over the summer months, we're going to study the fruit of the Spirit. God created the universe and then said to his creatures, be fruitful and multiply. Human beings demonstrate their desire for physical fruitfulness by having a garden full of flowers and vegetables, a farm flourishing with animals and crops, a business that's steadily growing, or a family. We demonstrate our desire for spiritual fruitfulness by developing Christian character. Unlike physical fruitfulness, the growth of godly qualities isn't something we can produce ourselves. It's the work of the Holy Spirit. When Jesus described himself as the true vine in John chapter 15, he pointed out that we can only bring forth the fruit of godly character by abiding in him. Abiding in Jesus means drawing all that we need from him rather than depending on our own wisdom and strength of character. This can only happen when the Holy Spirit works the miracle of rebirth in our heart, which enables us to repent of our sin and trust Jesus to be our Lord and Saviour. When this has happened, we have a crucial role to play in growing to be more like Jesus by learning from him through his word and depending on him in prayer. The Puritan John Owen explained that we are responsible for relying on the Holy Spirit, who is the Spirit of Christ, to enable us to be obedient to God's word so that spiritual fruit is preserved, increased, strengthened and improved in our life. The twin truths that we need to depend on God to produce spiritual fruit and that we're responsible for developing spiritual fruit is explained in Philippians chapter 2, which we read earlier. Look at verses 12 and 13. The Apostle Paul says, Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and act according to his good purpose. It's also important to remember that while the Holy Spirit enables the fruit of the Spirit to grow in us, he also enables it to grow beyond us, to bring us into fellowship with others. The most well-known list of the fruit of the Spirit is found in Galatians chapter 5. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control. However, from the study of other parts of Scripture, we can add about 20 more godly qualities to that list. Qualities like holiness, humility, compassion, contentment, thankfulness, considerateness, sincerity and perseverance, to name just a few. God willing, we'll examine the fruit of the Spirit which Paul lists in Galatians chapter 5 in the coming weeks. But today we're going to look at humility because without humility we can't hope to cultivate the rest of the fruit. Humility is the soil in which other godly qualities grow. Two verses from the book of Isaiah show us the regard with which God views the humble person. In Isaiah 57 we read, For this is what the High and Lofty One says, He who lives forever, whose name is holy. I live in a high and holy place, but also with him who is contrite and lowly in spirit, to revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite. And in Isaiah chapter 66, the Lord says, This is the one I esteem, he who is humble and contrite in spirit and trembles at my word. The promises of God that are contained in these verses for the truly humble person are amazing. The infinitely high and holy one who lives forever promises to dwell with them and honour them. Elsewhere in scripture, God promises to give the humble grace, to lift them up and to exalt them. Not only does God commend humility in his people, Jesus displayed humility in his humanity. 
In verse 8 of Philippians chapter 2, Paul says about Jesus, And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Jesus demonstrated the utmost humility in his death for us. But Jesus also exemplified humility throughout his life. He was born in the very humblest of circumstances. He was obedient to his earthly parents. He called people to himself as the one who was gentle and humble in heart. He said, I am among you as one who serves. He washed the disciples' feet on the night before his crucifixion. He taught, he who humbles himself will be exalted. Humility is a trait that Jesus displayed. And we're to seek the Holy Spirit's help to imitate how Jesus lived his life here on earth. We're going to look at four ways we should rely on the Holy Spirit to demonstrate humility. The first way is humility towards God. Humility towards God. Humility towards God is similar to fearing God. It begins with having a correct view of who God is. When we see God in his majesty, awesomeness and holiness, we're humbled before him. Every time we read in scripture that someone was privileged to view God in his glory, we see that they were humbled in God's presence. For example, Moses bowed to the ground and worshipped. Isaiah cried out, Woe to me! And Ezekiel fell face down. In our studies of Revelation, we saw that John fell at Jesus' feet as though dead, while the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the throne of the glorified Lamb. Humility in every area of life and in every relationship with other people begins with a right concept of God as the one who is infinite and eternal in his majesty and holiness. When relationships with people are good and circumstances are favourable, we are to humbly receive these blessings from God's gracious hand. When people are mistreating us and circumstances are difficult, we are to humbly accept these trials as from our infinitely wise and loving Heavenly Father. We can't begin to experience humility in any other relationship until we experience a deep humility in our attitude towards God. When we're conscious of our lowly position before the infinitely majestic and holy God, we won't be tempted to think that we're better than others or to compete with them. The second way we should rely on the Holy Spirit to demonstrate humility is humility towards God's word. Humility towards God's word. The person who is truly humble before God is also humble before God's word. I mentioned earlier that God says in Isaiah 66 that he esteems the person who is humble and contrite in heart and who trembles at his word. In 2 Kings chapter 22, we're told that when King Josiah heard the words of the book of the law, he tore his robe saying, Great is the Lord's anger that burns against us because our fathers have not obeyed the words of this book. Josiah realised that the word of God was the expression of the will of God, so it was to be obeyed, and failure to obey it would result in God's judgment. Josiah didn't try to dispute God's word. Instead, he trembled at it. He humbled himself. He acknowledged the sin of his people, and God listened to him. We also need to have this kind of humility towards the Bible. As we search the scriptures, we must allow them to search us so that they judge our character and our conduct. The Bible isn't just a source of information about God. It also shows us his will for our daily lives. We all need to increase our knowledge of God's word. But it should be for the purpose of obeying God's will. 
Paul prayed that God would fill the Colossian Christians with the knowledge of his will so that they might live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way. In Luke chapter 10, we read that Jesus prayed, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and learned and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for this was your good pleasure. It's terribly sad when someone thinks that they know enough about God that they don't need to study his word every day or hear it explained to them every week or discuss it with other believers or spend time reading good material that will help them to grow to be more like Christ. We need to pray that God will continually enable us to be humble towards his word. The third way we should rely on the Holy Spirit to demonstrate humility is humility towards ourselves. Humility towards ourselves. When we're truly humble before God and his word, we'll also be humble about our gifts, abilities and achievements because we'll realise and gratefully acknowledge that all we are and all that we have comes from the hand of God. This aspect of humility actually begins with our understanding of salvation. Scripture clearly teaches that we're saved by the grace of God alone and not because of anything we've done. So we need to guard against thinking that we contributed in some way to our salvation. God doesn't save us because we're better or wiser or more likely to believe the gospel than other people. Elvis Presley, amongst others, sang a song entitled, Why Me, Lord? But it's pointless to ask that question because God told Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy. It's incredibly humbling to recognise that there's nothing about us that explains why God saved us. Paul told Timothy, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of which I am the worst. Paul was too overwhelmed with the fact that the grace of God was sufficient to save even him, to think that there was anything about him which meant he deserved salvation. Humility with regard to our salvation should lead us to recognise that all our abilities and achievements are also a result of God's grace. In his first letter to the Corinthian Christians, Paul asks, For who makes you different from anyone else? What do you have that you did not receive? And if you did receive it, why do you boast as though you did not? Every gift we have comes from God, and he's given it to us to be used for his glory as we serve him. Paul refused to take the credit for his abilities or even his hard work. He also declares in 1 Corinthians, by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace to me was not without effect. No, I work harder than all of them. Yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. So rather than lamenting how hard we have to work as we serve God faithfully in our congregation, Let's credit our hard work and faithfulness strictly to the grace of God. Paul Paul also made clear to the Christians in Corinth that God is responsible for any spiritual success we have when he stated, So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. When Moses was giving his final instructions to the children of Israel before they entered the promised land, he specifically warned them in Deuteronomy chapter 8 against the pride that leads to taking credit for any sort of success with these words. You may say to yourself, my power and the strength of my hands have produced this wealth for me. But remember the Lord your God. For it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth and so confirms his covenant which he swore to your fathers as it is today. 
Humility with regards to ourselves consists in ascribing all that we are, all that we have, and all that we have accomplished to God's grace. The fourth way we should rely on the Holy Spirit to demonstrate humility is humility towards others. Humility towards others. A believer who's humble towards God, God's word, and themselves will also be humble towards other people. One way this humility expresses itself is by submitting to one another. In Ephesians chapter 5, Paul instructs us to submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Submitting to one another doesn't mean always giving in to other people's demands or opinions. It means being willing to submit to instruction so that we're teachable. It also means being willing to admit that we were wrong when another believer points out from Scripture where we have gone astray. Apollos provides us with a good example of submitting to instruction. In Acts chapter 18, Luke tells us that Apollos was a learned man who had been instructed in the way of the Lord so that he was able to speak about Jesus with great fervour. Apollos was undoubtedly a capable man. But Luke informs us that while Apollos had a thorough knowledge of the scriptures and taught about Jesus accurately, he knew only the baptism of John. Priscilla and Aquila were a godly couple in the church at Ephesus. When they heard Apollos speaking, they invited him to their home and they explained the way of God more adequately to him. Although Apollos was a gifted minister, he was willing to receive instruction from Priscilla and Aquila. This meant that when Apollos wanted to go on to serve the Lord in Achaia, the church at Ephesus not only encouraged him, they also wrote a letter to the Achaean Christians, telling them to welcome him. Peter provides us with a good example of submitting to correction by another believer. We have seen in our midweek studies of Galatians that when Peter came to Antioch, Paul rebuked Peter for his hypocrisy with regard to the Gentile Christians. We know that Peter didn't harbour any ill feeling towards Paul for doing this because in one of his letters, Peter refers to Paul as our dear brother and he speaks of Paul's letters as scripture, meaning they're part of God's word. Peter accepted Paul's rebuke and humbly submitted himself to Paul's correction, even though Paul was younger in the faith than he was. Submitting to others' teaching or correction is difficult for our naturally proud hearts. But the context of Paul's instruction in Ephesians chapter 5 to submit to one another indicates that it's one of the evidences of being filled with the Spirit. Humility is a fruit of the Spirit that's a result of his ministry in our heart. But this ministry won't take place without deliberate, conscious effort on our part. The Spirit doesn't make us humble. He enables us to humble ourselves in these difficult situations. A second way to show humility towards others is by serving one another. In this area, Jesus is our greatest example. I've already mentioned how Jesus washed the disciples' feet on the night before his crucifixion. But Jesus' whole life was one of serving others. He said he didn't come to be served, but to serve. And he went around doing good to others. In Luke chapter 12, Jesus even seems to indicate that he'll be serving us in eternity. In addition to the example he set us, Jesus also taught us the importance of serving one another. In Matthew chapter 20, Jesus indicated that true greatness in the kingdom of God isn't about position, it's about serving. And he promised to bless those who followed his example in serving others. We can only be humble enough to serve others by the grace of God. Since God's grace is sufficient to meet all of our needs, anyone can learn 
to serve others. Paul tells us that those who serve should do it with the strength God provides, so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. We all know people, even unbelievers, who serve others in one way or another. However, they don't give God the glory. They keep it for themselves. But when we serve others by depending on God's grace for the strength he supplies to do it, then God is glorified. A third way to demonstrate humility towards others is by honouring one another. Paul says in Romans chapter 12, honour one another above yourselves. And in verse 3 of Philippians chapter 2, Paul says, consider others better than yourselves. We're to place other people above ourselves when it comes to position, concern or need. Jesus rebuked the Pharisees for seeking the places of honour at feasts and told them to seek out the lowest place instead. So we need to ask God to show us those areas in our life where we assert ourselves at the expense of others or where we fail to consider the concerns or needs of others because we're so preoccupied with our own concerns or needs. If we are to experience the blessings God promises to the humble, we must demonstrate this humility in our daily relationships with others. We do this by relying on the Spirit's power to submit to one another, to serve one another, and to honour one another above ourselves. Memorising passages of Scripture which deal with the area or areas of humility we're struggling with is a very helpful practice. You'll see that along with today's order of service, I've posted Bible verses which are related to each type of humility we have looked at. As we memorize and then meditate on such scriptures, the Holy Spirit will transform us inwardly. And this will be seen outwardly in our words and actions. The Holy Spirit will also use these scriptures we memorize to convict us when we fall short of what they teach in specific situations. As he does, we should confess our sin, knowing that God will forgive us when we're truly sorry. And we should also ask him to enable us to rely on the Holy Spirit's strength, not to fail in this way in the future. Whatever area of humility we need to work on, it's important we do so in dependence upon God, who is at work in us. Let us come to him now in prayer, seeking his help to apply these lessons to our heart. Let us pray. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we recognise that humility is a fruit which the Holy Spirit produces in the life of a genuine believer. Enable us to cultivate this fruit so that we are humble towards you, humble towards your word, humble towards ourselves, and humble towards others. We praise you for the blessings you promise to those who depend upon you to be truly humble. In Jesus' lovely name we pray. Amen. Our closing hymn is From Heaven You Came, Helpless Be It. We have seen that Jesus is the supreme example of humility. This hymn encourages us to humbly trust him to be our saviour and to rely on his strength so that we can follow his example of serving others. i
This is our God, the servant's King. He calls us now to follow Him, to bring our lives as a daily offering of worship to the servant's King. with sorrow was torn, yet not my will but yours he said, this is our God, the servant's King, he calls us now. that speak of sacrifice, hands that flung stars into space, to cool nail surrender. This is our God, the servant King. He calls us now. peace himself sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who called you is faithful. He will surely do it. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen.